Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm chatting with Grant Moore from SBC Nickel. In this interview, we discuss the dynamics in the nickel market, as well as the need for class one nickel to be classified differently for major auto manufacturers in order to ensure that we are using the cleanest nickel available in our electric vehicles. We also get into SPC Nickel, which is a nickel exploration company with a joint venture with Valet exploring for nickel in Sudbury. And they also have an interesting project in Nunavut as well. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. Grant, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's start off talking a little bit of macro. Uh, nickel has been rallying a little bit over the last few months. However, it's been a bit of a rough year for a lot of the nickel uh, juniors, we'll say. Uh, do you think that things have, have, have turned for the commodity in terms of nickel prices? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I'd certainly agree with you that it's been a, it was a pretty tough 2023. And, and you know, as we moved into 2024, I think we started to see a bit of a rebound. You know, my hope is, is that that's going to continue or at least stabilize to the point where we can kind of be comfortable with a nickel price moving forward. Um, you know, overall, I think the fundamentals are still strong, uh, but certainly the impact of nickel production in, in Indonesia and, uh, you know, the discussions about uh, uh, class one and class two nickel are certainly weighing on the commodity right now. There's, I mean, there's no denying that. So, you know, I think in the long term, we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction. And, you know, it just might be a bit of a bumpy road here over uh, the short period. So when, when we think about the nickel market, uh, Indonesia and the East generally are said to be controlling the market dynamics right now. Is there anything that the Western producers can do to sort of change this dynamic? Yeah. You know, and, and really the push right now on is to separate the nickel that is, uh, you know, has a high carbon footprint compared to, uh, low carbon footprint production, which we see in places like uh, Canada, uh, Europe, Australia. So these are the more of the nickel sulfide deposits compared to the laterite deposits in, in Indonesia and places like the Philippines, which basically are the, the predominant source of nickel for areas like China. So that is the big push that's coming on is to get automotive makers to switch and preferably choose uh, you know, nickel that is sourced from sustainable areas with with good environmental practices, and and that's the the push that's on. It's a you know, it's a, certainly a challenge, but uh, that's the direction that I think we're headed. And if we do, then areas such as Sudbury, where we work, uh, would certainly benefit from that. Yeah, I, I, it 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 appears that that is sort of the big uh, hurdle right now for. A lot of these nickel projects, whether we're talking about Canada Nickel or some of the other names, I, I I could name a whole bunch of them. I I feel like, and I have no position in Canada Nickel, uh, but that they've done a very good job as in terms of both capital markets uh, programming, we'll say, and being able to raise money, and uh, but more importantly, create awareness and try to show that there is a path forward for sort of a low grade nickel project to get to something that is more of a uh, clean uh, source than than what we're seeing out of, say, Indonesia. So let's talk about SPC Nickel, which is your baby. Uh, what's the two minute elevator pitch for the company? Well, we are a nickel focused company. Uh, we've listed on the TSX uh, around three years ago. Uh, and really the what separates us from a lot of other companies is our location, where we're based, and that is the Sudbury Mining Camp, which is arguably the uh, certainly the largest camp in in Canada, and probably the second largest nickel camp in the world, next to Norilsk. Norilsk, sorry. Uh, so we have access and infrastructure that most regions don't have when it comes to building and developing a new asset, and and I think that's what sets us apart. We have major international companies. Uh, like Ballet and Glencore, based in Sudbury, with the infrastructure that we would be simply adding on to. Uh, so the timeline to put something into production, which 
traditionally is in that 10 to 15 years is shortened significantly because of the infrastructure that we have in front of us. Okay, so you guys have a, f a few projects, most of them in Sudbury. I see you guys have one project in Nunavut, uh, but let's 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 talk about the Sudbury projects. Uh, the West Graham deposit, I assume, is the one that you guys are mostly focused on right now. Uh, how how much drilling has been done on the projects historically? Uh, historically, I would say there's you know in excess of thirty thousand meters. Uh, we acquired the property in 2016, and then subsequently last year completed a deal with Valet to basically consolidate the area, which essentially took two halves of a resource and put them together. And, and we now control that or have the option to earn 100% in, in the entire resource. Uh, we did around 14,000 meters of drilling last year in order to allow us to have an updated resource that we put out at the beginning of this year. Okay, and what what can you tell me? So 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 you guys have an option. I see on on the Jane's project. And uh, do you guys own one hundred percent of the West Graham deposit? So we we uh, initially or we we have one hundred percent of the property that we initially acquired, uh, which contained half of the West Graham deposit. We signed an option agreement with Valet, which allows us to earn 100% in the other half that we didn't own. And that's the two basically work commitments. Uh, and uh, and then it's subject to once in production where Valet has uh, uh, a royalty on. So for, and I think this is kind of a big issue when it comes to just junior mining in general is that we're seeing such a small amount of projects actually get to production that it's hard to go to uh, retail investors and say, this exploration project looks really interesting because there's not really a roadmap of companies that are actually getting to production. And, and from my perspective, when we look at, and people complain about the lack of money flowing into the uh, junior space, that's a big part of it is when, when, when there's like no roadmap for how to actually get to production, and you're investing in something that's early stage, it's like, okay, well, you guys get some successful drill holes, then what? Maybe you could walk us through what that roadmap to success looks like uh, for SPC Nickel and, and, and how you're not just going to be trapped in this endless cycle of raising money and drilling to, to, that's going to require you to raise more money to drill, that's going to require you, you know, to raise yeah. more money to drill, that eventually get yourself to a point where, okay, now we have to go get all this financing done to get to production. If I'm a retail investor, how how do I get comfort in uh, in, 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 in buying shares in SPC Nickel? Well, you bring up a good point. And I think there was a study that came out recently that suggested that the time frame from discovery to production is, you know, in excess of 15 years now, which, you know, it is a long time. And if you are that investor, at the early stage, you know, you, you don't necessarily have 15 years to wait to see that return. For us, I would say what separates us and makes this a little bit different is one location and infrastructure. So we don't have to build all the infrastructure that most of these nickel projects, or not just nickel projects, but even base metal projects might have to. You know, for example, we don't need to build a mill, a smelter, uh, refining capabilities, uh, road infrastructure, the power, all of that is in Sudbury. So from from a development point of view, we can certainly speed up that process and also reduce sub, uh, substantially the cost. Our property as it stands, we're looking at an open pit. You can right now drive your car to the site on a paved road. Uh, we are within 30 kilometers uh, shipping distance to existing nickel sulfide mills that have capacity. And, uh, you know, there's a power system right on site. So that certainly accelerates that time frame. Uh, the other aspect that we are looking at is we have a large kind of global resource on the property, but we also feel like there is a, uh, a significant starter pit that we would get begin our activities on. And this pit is something that has a very low strip ratio. It mineralization is at surface. 
And we feel that that could be put into production very quickly, even at current metal prices, and would in turn start to generate free cash flow for the company relatively quickly. And because we don't have to develop all the infrastructure, we're not talking about a deep underground mine, we are talking about a surface mine, is that we think the capex can be very small, uh, you know, less than $10 million to get this project going, even maybe even less than that. And that's something that's quite unique in the nickel space for most of these projects, uh, is that ability to get a project into production relatively quick, start to generate some cash flow, which then allows you to put that cash flow back either into the project to expand it, you know, into another project, gives you a lot of flexibilities that uh, allow you maybe not to have to necessarily go back to the market. So what do the exploration plans look like for 2024? Well, we uh, we hope to be back out drilling in, uh, you know, I would say maybe a, in a month. So as I had mentioned before, we are, we put out the resource in the, in January and now we're focusing in on this starter pit. That's probably the, the total resource was in, is around 22 million tons, but there is a around 3 million ton starter pit that we're going to focus on. So we'll be doing infill drilling in that so we can move it into uh, a measured category and move forward with move towards PEA by the end of the year, as well as initiating some of the studies that are required for us to basically get to a, a spot part where we're able to uh, apply for a mining permit. So, so you guys also have a project in Nunavut. Uh, my understanding is Nunavut's largely unexplored. So a little bit of a lottery ticket there. What can you tell us? Well, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think Nunavut is kind of one of the last frontiers in, in Canada for exploration. I've been up there uh, many times doing work and, you know, it is a truly spectacular place with regards to geology and opportunities. Uh, our project up there is called the Muskox project. And, you know, it was discovered back in the 60s by Inco. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it, in my opinion, is one of the top kind of grassroots nickel projects in North America. It has tremendous scale, not just to be a, a, a to find a deposit, but it, it has potential to be a district scale opportunity. And, you know, we have over 65,000 hectares it with in, in in this in on this property where there's high grade massive sulfide over 120 kilometers in strike length that we've that we've sampled so it is a really impressive property you know you can't deny the fact that it is kind of remote but i think that's changing a lot how how expensive is it to maintain those claims i mean that, that's a pretty big land package the maintenance of the claims are not that bad. Uh, I think it's on average around uh, $150,000 a year to maintain the claims. So it, it's quite reasonable. It's comparable to what it would be in Ontario. Yeah, which if, I mean, if you're a publicly traded mining company, that shouldn't be anything to scoff at. <laughs> no. But the last couple of years uh, in the Canadian capital markets have have had their challenges. Yeah. So, Something I love to ask uh, stocks that, you know, Canadian penny stocks about, because I think it's a very relevant question for retail investors uh, looking at the story. What can you tell us about your cap table? How, how, how much have most shareholders paid for stock? Are, are there any escrowed shares at this stage? I assume not, but I'll ask that anyways. Any notable investors uh, in the company? Yeah, our, our major or largest investor is Dundee Goodman. In, and that gentleman's name is, or that runs that is Jonathan Goodman. He's, uh, you know, very well known in the mining space, big fan of Sudbury and a big fan of nickel space. So he's been uh, uh, a consistent shareholder of SPC since we went public. They're one of our larger short shareholders. Uh, RCF is another large shareholder. And, uh, you know, there's no shares in escrow. I think we have around 150 million shares outstanding. And um, yeah, that's more or less the, the cap structure of the table, uh, sorry, of the company. Okay, so last question. If I'm an investor in SBC Nickel or I'm uh, looking at Nickel Juniors and uh, I, I'm watching this story, what, what does 2024 look like in terms of timelines, potential catalysts, milestones? 
Yeah, so we announced uh, or that uh, a valet uh, initiated some metallurgical work on our property based on our relationship. So we started that uh, a few weeks ago. So I suspect towards the end of the month into next month, we should have results from the metallurgical work. I also anticipate us getting the drills turning in uh, next month. So then we'll have a fairly steady stream of news flow from the drill results. Uh, and really we're working towards a PEA towards the end of the year. All right, well, Grant, thanks very much for hopping on here today. Uh, I find uh, this nickel story, it, it's it just in general, the nickel story really interesting. I think that uh, if if the class one argument does come into play, which it really should, uh, if if the whole purpose of going to electric vehicles is yeah. to be more environmentally conscious, uh, it, this this really should be uh, at the forefront of uh, the discussions of battery metals. Uh, and should that catalyst uh, actually come to fruition, I think that all these names are going to suddenly become really really attractive. That's that's it. That's in my opinion the bet here. If you're betting on on the nickel names, and uh, in addition to that, you guys have lots of exploration going on. So there's obviously uh, some great opportunities for some discoveries. And uh, hopefully, when you hit one of those, you'll come back on here and still chat with us. Will do. Thanks for having us. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Also, let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks, everyone.